what is the pathophysiology of TBM, how the disease progresses, how the disease actually happens. So I will be doing it in a flowchart form to simplify it for you. So initially there is a primary infection. The primary infection usually occurs in the lungs. There is a tubercle focus in the lungs. From there it will spread to the CNS. How the spread will occur? It will occur in the form of the original concept was hematogenous dissemination is seen. But Nelson says it can be both lymphatic and hematogenous. So it uses the word called as lymphohematogenous spread. So there is a lymphohematogenous dissemination that is spread of the tubercle bacilli from the primary infection into the CNS. In CNS it reaches the CNS. In CNS what does it do? It forms an entity known as a rich focus. What is a rich focus? A rich focus is a localized it is a localized metastatic caseous lesion. Caseous means like a cheesy. So it is a localized metastatic caseous lesion which forms on the superficial parts of the cerebral cortex or on the meninges. It acts like a space where the tubercle bacilli are filled. It is a localized collection of high density of tubercle bacilli. Repeatedly what will happen? This rich focus will lead to discharge of tubercle bacilli or TB bacilli into the subarachnoid space. Whenever they will enter the subarachnoid space, that is what is there in subarachnoid space? There is CSF. So it will lead to the formation of gelatinous exudates in the patient. And it will also lead to inflammation happening in the subarachnoid space and in the CSF. This gelatinous exudate will cause infiltration and involvement of the corticomeningeal, corticomeningeal blood vessels. It will cause CSF obstruction at the level of basal cisterns or also called as basilar cisterns. Because of the infiltration and involvement of corticomeningeal blood vessels, it will lead to the development of CNS infarcts. It will lead to the development of cerebral edema in the patient. It will also lead to CNS vasculitis. And because of the involvement of the CSF obstruction, the patient will develop hydrocephalus. Which is the type of hydrocephalus seen in tubercle meningitis? Please understand, usually it occurs in the form of communicating hydrocephalus. However, non-communicating hydrocephalus has also been described. So, uh, the type of hydrocephalus is due to obstruction or uh, problem in the absorption of CSF in the basal system region and beyond. You know that whenever there is an obstruction to the flow of CSF in the ventricular system itself, that is called as obstructive hydrocephalus. And whenever there is a problem in the basal system area, subarachnoid space or absorption by arachnoid villi, it produces a non-obstructive also called as communicating hydrocephalus. So remember, it is more commonly communicating hydrocephalus communicating hydrocephalus which is more common compared to obstructive hydrocephalus. So this is the pathophysiology of tubercle, tubercular meningitis in simplified words. What is rich focus can be asked in the exam. The word rich focus where pathophysiology is mentioned in Nelson, it is not mentioned there. So please understand that this is the rich focus. Now what are the clinical stages of TBM? TBM evolves over three stages. Stage one is the non-specific stage. Stage two, there are CNS signs particularly the meningeal signs and stage 3 will be the complication stage. So what are the three stages? The first stage is called as stage 1. In stage 1, the stage 1 lasts for about 1 to 2 weeks. In stage 1, the features are usually non-specific. So the child will have features like fever, there will be irritability, the child will have malaise, the child will have headache, etc. But there are no 
focal deficits. So focal neurological deficits are classically absent. So no focal deficits are seen. Sometimes if tubercle meningitis is happening in infants, you will find that there is a loss of recently acquired milestones in some of these patients. So that will occur in stage 1. Stage 1, the degree of fever is usually moderate grade. Uh, textbooks sometimes say that there is an evening rise in temperature, but in clinical practice that evening rise of temperature is not always present. So moderate to low grade fever, non-specific features, irritability, headache will be there for 1 to 2 weeks. Some of the Indian textbooks say it can last for up to 4 weeks, but most of the western textbooks and standard books, standard articles say it is about 1 to 2 weeks. So we will stick with Nelson here. Second is the stage 2. Now stage 2 is the one which is a dramatic stage. So there will be abrupt onset of CNS features. What are the CNS features which will appear? So acute onset of CNS features will happen in the form of vomiting. There will be meningeal signs developing in the patient. So meningeal signs will become positive. What are the meningeal signs? Obviously, these patients will have nuchal rigidity, they will have Koenig sign and they will have Brusinski sign. You know already from the other uh, meningitis discussion that we had that Koenig, Brusinski sign etc. will be absent below 18 to 24 months of age. But in an older child, these meningeal signs will be present. Children will also have seizures. So seizures will be present in some of these patients. Uh, sometimes. Cranial nerve palsies can be the seen and some of these patients can have hypertonia as well. And focal neurological deficits, they appear in stage 2. So if they ask what is the stage during which focal deficits appear, they appear in stage 2. And then we have the stage 3. Stage 3 is called as the CNS complication stage. So this is the stage where there are CNS complications and the non-CNS like systemic complications will also happen. So the patient will develop features like hemiplegia, there can be paraplegia, the patient can have development of hydrocephalus which can progress to raised intracranial pressure, there can be hypertension in the patient, there will be decorticate posturing due to involvement of vital centers. So vital center involvement can happen and that can lead to death in the patient. Please understand that all the children who are in stage 1, if you see therapy in this stage, if you diagnose in this stage, they have an excellent outcome. Children with stage 2 features, they may require a prolonged therapy, but they usually also have a good outcome. All the children who reach stage 3, they have a poor prognosis. All the children who survive are usually left with some of the sequelae. The sequelae can be in the form of mental retardation, it can be in the form of persistent cranial nerve palsies, it can be in the form of cortical blindness, it can also be in the form of uh, deafness in the patient. So all these sequelae, so if they ask you, sequelae are frequently found in which stage? They are found in the stage 3, that is the CNS complication stage. So these are the three clinical stages of tubercular meningitis that you should know. Thank you.